So today we're gonna to learn about federated machine learning on FEVM. So I'll share a little bit about me, um, talk about um, you know, the impact of machine learning and how it's you know, growing like every day like tremendously and how we can combine federated machine learning and blockchain. So here's a little bit about me. I'm a data engineer and blockchain developer. I'm crazy about data. Um, I have like a very like eclectic engineering experience from academic research to consulting, entrepreneurship, working with CPG brands. And to me, the biggest part of my development in Web3 has definitely been participating in hackathons and DAOs, including being involved with Dorg, which is like a DAO that you know provides services to um, different startups and businesses in Web3 for you know software engineering and design, all that good stuff. And you can find me on social and all that good stuff under Techie T. So why is this so important? So according to McKinsey's um, AI report, by 2030, the global economic impact of AI, machine learning, and automation is going to be more than $13 trillion. That's a lot of money, right? But we still have a lot of unanswered questions about how this will impact a lot of different industries. Think about all the uh, models that have become really popular um, over just the past few months and have become a, um, just like everyday language and everyday experiences from stable diffusion, chat GPT, mid journey, BARD, Bing. And these uh, models are not just gonna be isolated to single industries. They're gonna have a tremendous impact on things like public policy, um, safety management, um, decision making, law, medicine. So how can we think about pushing this um, boundary even further and integrating this into blockchain. So this is why I'm really excited about federated machine learning. So with the average machine learning model that you have right now, the model um, and the data are, have to work pretty close together. So you have to share the data from your devices um, to these models and then use that to train the model and then you know, develop the model, right? But with federated machine learning, it takes a completely different approach. It says instead of us sending, you can see here, Sad clown, right? So the data is being um, sent away from um, the devices to the model, and we can actually change it to where the model is being sent to um, the device instead of the data being sent. This allows for more data privacy for the user. This allows for us to expand new use cases in different industries where um, data privacy is really important. Think about law and medicine, where you have a lot of different regulatory things and laws that uh, prohibit how data can be shared but we're missing out on a lot of those machine learning insights because of the regulatory things around that. FNL will, um, will allow us to explore what those uh, use cases will look like in these highly regulated, regulated spaces while still protecting the privacy of the user. It also makes you think about uh, everyday items like your Google Assistant or Siri or your different IoT devices that are at home. You don't want your data that you sh um, have made at home and different things you've asked, you know, Alexa and Siri to be shared with all the other users in that network, right? But you might want to still benefit from the machine learning insights on your individual data. So um, let's actually build one during uh, this little workshop and deploy to FEVM. So if you really wanna follow along, you can scan this link right here um, and then that will give you all the materials give you the Google Colab link, we'll also give you the repo um, for uh, the model and the smart contract. So I like interaction, I like feedback, so if you're doing good, you say I'm doing good. So every time I ask, like, it's, give me a thumbs up, let me know you're breathing, you're alive or something, okay? So, <laughs> so if everybody who wants to follow along has it, give me a thumbs up, are you good? You're good, okay. So I'm gonna switch to the um, Google Colab. So the reason why I use Google Colab is because we can run this completely online without having to um, deal with the local environment. So as long as you go to the link right here, we're gonna go through each step and I'll explain what's happening in each part, okay? So first we gotta install our packages, right? So just press the little play button right there. It's gonna do all the installation, the packages that we need. The main package that we'll be using is something called Flowers. Flowers is a very user-friendly federated machine learning um, package in Python. Um, and to me, it's one of the uh, best uh, libraries I found for the ones I tested out um, because you don't have to do a lot of configuration before running it and you can run it in you know, a nice environment like Google Colab. Um, you can also run in your local environment too if you know, that's what you choose. So this takes a few seconds for it to go. It's loading, it's thinking, it's doing all that good stuff in the background. Then after that, we're gonna um, do all the imports that we need. And also tell you about the data set that we're using. Um, the data set that we're using is basically used for 
object detection. Uh, it's used uh, in a lot of like visual uh, visual detection um, algorithms. About over 66,000 images in 10 different classes. Um, it's used uh, pretty widely. So now we've done all the imports and the installs, and now we're gonna load the data right here. CIFAR10 is the data set we're using. So if you wanna um, learn more about the data set, just go here and check it out. These are the classes that we'll be using, common everyday objects, you know, plane, car, bird, cat, normal stuff, right? So we define our classes right here. Now we're gonna determine the number of clients. So for this demonstration, I'm only defining 16. It's a pretty small number, right? But if we get into large numbers, like 100 or so, I tried out different uh, numbers of classes and batches. Oh. But let's see. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when you go beyond like around 20 or so, Google Colab starts to freak out. So keep it small if you're gonna be running it um, in an online environment. But uh, for this one, I defined 16 clients. So this would be like the equivalent of having 16 cell phones. So for our little experiment, we're gonna imagine that we have 16 cell phones and we wanna be able to detect the different objects that are in the images of the cell phone without actually sharing the uh, personal data of each cell phone, right? So after that, we wanna define our batch size. We wanna load and split the data. This is just like your regular approach you do for regular machine learning models so far. So we have a batch size of 50, we're loading the data set, we're splitting it up, so that means when we're doing a splitting and training, that means we're gonna use some of our data for training the model, and then we're gonna do some of our data for testing the model. So your usual approach of how you're doing you know, machine learning stuff. You know, it's finished, and now we need to configure our labels. So we're gonna use the classes that we defined earlier, like cat, dog, plane, all that good stuff, and we're gonna use that for the labels to actually figure out, okay, well, what is each thing in this image? And it's gonna spit out some examples for us. So you see here, we got some images and we see you know, how well was it able to determine what each thing was in the image. We got a little doggy here, a little plane, a little ship. So our model's working pretty well like it's supposed to, right? But now we need to uh, develop this with a convolutional neural network, which is like a pretty robust um, image identification um, algorithm, defining our classes, Again, we just press the play button here. Let me know if I'm going too quickly or you want me to uh, stop and explain something further. And we need to find our training and test functions. So this will determine basically how many times that the algorithm is gonna go over the data and um, keep going over it and, uh, to train itself and what it's looking at. And you can change a lot of things here for the flower. Um, um, library, you can uh, change the epic, you, know, you can change um, how much um, entropy loss that you want to have. It's a lot of things that you can um, personalize based off what you want for your model and for your data set. And then also, like, what's the acceptable accuracy and loss, all that good stuff. And so then here, we're going to train the model. This one takes a little bit uh, a little bit longer. So you can see here each epic is going through and trying to improve its accuracy of identifying the objects and is outputting it each time. So the accuracy right now isn't very great because we would have to train it uh, for a longer time. Um, but if you did give it uh, more rounds to train itself, then the accuracy would continue to improve. But for the first uh, time around, it's pretty good. We got a little bit under 40% accuracy. And so now we set up the federated um, learning with the flower the flower package. So we define our parameters, we define uh, the, the dictionary, the load, all that good stuff. The most important part right here is where we implement the flower client. And so this is where it takes the data um, that we all pr um, provided and then it divides it up. Or it partitions it into smaller sets because this is simulated to be different devices, right? If you had a real data, uh, real data set coming from different cell phone devices, it would already be split up. But to simulate that, we were just partitioning it to make it seem like it's coming from 16 separate devices. Then we turn the client and then we start the training for the flower client. And you can see the output here. And it's telling you which step of, each of the process it's on. 
So how many uh, clients have been sampled out of 16? So this is another thing about uh, FML. So it's randomly deciding which of the 16 is gonna use uh, to uh, work with the model on. Um, this is potentially could be a downside of FML in its early stages, because what if you have one cell phone that has a lot more data on it than another cell phone, right? And so that could sway how, um, the development of the model. But to me, I think um, some of those things can be, be controlled at the smart contract level. Like you can say, we only wanna accept this amount of data uh, from this particular device, or we can even say that we only wanna accept data of this quality um, before it can be used for the model. I think the benefits of FML way out um, number the downsides of it. So this one takes a little bit, <laughs> it's going. Sometimes it can take like two or three minutes But you can see the progress as it's happening in real time. Oh, also, one thing that will make it run faster too is when you go to your runtime here, you can go to, uh, I'm not gonna change it right now, but I'll show you how to change it. You can change your um, runtime right here. So by default, when you go to Google Colab, it's um, set at none, but, but if you set it to GPU, that will make it run a lot faster. And it's freaking free, which is great. So it's going on to its next round. It's sampled five clients out of 16 so far. Okay, now it's getting close to the, the end of the sampling. It's going. <laughs> After this step is completed right here, then we'll use a virtual client and then we can uh, get the accuracies and examples. So this is the second to last step um, right there. Then after that step is done, um, read the dictionaries and then we'll export the model and we can use that in the smart contract. Okay, it's going, it's going. It takes a minute. So we're on round four. Sometimes also, uh, if you're on like the free tier for Google Colab, if there are a lot of um, people using it at that time, it's a little bit slower. So usually it gets done in like two minutes. Now it's on three, but it should be done pretty shortly. Then we can move on to the next step. And it also gives you like the failure um, rates of each round of training. Um, so it's all showing you in real time, like how well the model is training itself. It's going. Okay, close to finishing. We can press the, um, continue on with the next step and then it will catch up with us. So um, after that step is completed, then you'll have, um, you'll have to use the virtual client engine in Flower. And this is just gonna be a further evaluation of the accuracy and the examples um, provided. So we'll go ahead and process that. And so, you know, it will just put it in the queue to be processed. Then we wanna create a strategy um, to call the function whenever it receives an evaluation metric. And so you can define each of these things based off what you want for your data, based off what you want for the accuracy, um, based off of what you want for the fit. So you can see here, fraction fit, um, fraction evalu evaluation, the number of clients, um, number of clients you want to be used for the evaluation, the minimum um, number of clients you want to be used. So that means basically, like unless there's at least that number of clients there, separate devices, 
then you, um, if that's not met, then the, it wouldn't run. Okay, Let's see, both of those finished. So now we create the strategy. This step goes pretty quickly. So now I'm creating the simulation uh, with the flowers package. With all the initial parameters that were defined. So right after that, this step is done right here, then we'll save the model and export it. So all these steps that we've done right now are pretty uh, a combination of traditional machine learning methods you see, the irregular training, uh, splitting the data, checking for accuracy, all that's the irregular machine learning approach. The part that's different is the partitioning, right? So we were able to partition um, the data and uh, make it uh, be simulated to look like it's coming from separate devices, right? And so also like how the model is uh, share it with the data, right? So instead of the data being sent to the model, the model is coming to the data. So that's very different than, um, that's a very different part from federal machine learning compared to regular machine learning. So this is the last step for the training evaluation. After this, we just export the model. And if you are on the GitHub page, I already exported the model and put it in the folder. So it's in like the root folder, so you don't have to go through all the steps here to get the model to follow through the next part. Okay. It's going. So after that part is finished, I'm just gonna put this in the queue for it to run this next. So uh, unless you have like a, you know, an infrastructure already set up where you're doing like CI CD for your model or something, you need to like export your model and save it somewhere. Cause otherwise you're gonna lose all the freaking progress you just made on training your model. So we're gonna save it. We save it to this model path right here. Then um, we load the model path. Um, and we need to put it into a format that can actually be usable for the smart contract. So there's a the pretty robust like um, format called Onyx that's used in machine learning. So once we uh, basically export it as an Onyx um, file, this will allow us to basically put the model, define the model in terms of bytes so that we can call on the model within the smart contract and uh, with our model service. So we just do that, uh, imp doing the same thing, importing and the installs we need to create the Onyx uh, file. And then we need to convert it to binary code. And then we're gonna read that model from the file. And I'm saving it as a text file and then that ends up being used. But I already have the outputs from when I ran, ran this earlier. Basically this was what it ends up on being. So this is a gigantic file <laughs> with the bytecode in it that represents the model and then we can use this uh, to actually make a model service with a smart contract. Everybody following? So I'm gonna review what just happened. So first we made our model, right? We uh, were able to create the model using our open source data and we were able to simulate it coming from 16 separate devices. And we were able to make the FML package using flowers package, right? but the model needs to be put into a format that can be understood by smart contracts. So that's why we had to export it as an Onyx file and put it into um, bytecode so we can use in our smart contract. Okay, so here's the next part. So now we're going to put this on chain. Okay, so I think everybody in the room probably knows because we're all like really into data and all good stuff uh, about Protocol Labs, you know, recently released the mainnet for FEVM. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, I just randomly thought about this one day. It's like, oh, okay, what about machine learning on chain? So we can create a, a model service uh, with this, this smart contract right here. So I just forked the, the basic FEVM um, hard hat kit and then I just changed the simple coin contract to a contract that could be used to deploy the model and also could be used to send predictions to it. But I forgot to show you one thing. So when you're in Google Colab, you have to export your model. 
And so if you go to the side here, this is where your files will be, and then you can click on um, any of the folders and you can download the folder from, or the file from there. And so if we had ran it all the way to here, then it would show the file, you export that, and then you just put that in your local hard hat project. You can also run your hard hat project on Gitpod. Um, I use IntelliJ because that's my favorite um, IDE, but it really doesn't matter. As long as you can run hard hat in it, you can use anything you want. But if you fork the GitHub project, um, it will have everything you need in it. Here's the smart contract right here. It's a simple smart contract to deploy, one, deploy the model, and then two, to send predictions to it um, in terms of bytes. And then you can see here, right here, this is where I put the, the output for the model. So everything you need is already in the GitHub, um, GitHub repo. You just clone it and then Everything is regular, right? And then you just deploy it just like regular. Oh, and I'm sure you know, you need your .env with your private key in it. So you can define your private key from the command line or you can just go to a new file and then put your private key in there. And please, please, please make sure to add that to get ignore. You don't want your private key on GitHub. Wait a second, there's a little bit of an error happening. One second. Let's see. So, hmm. I made one update to it. Now it's acting crazy. I have another version of the file before the change. There we go. <laughs> okay, so it's deploying it. So I didn't change any of the other um, default contracts that are in there, like the storage deal, all that good stuff. So it's deploying it right now. It's a little bit slow. Um, so first we'll deploy the model service and then we'll deploy the other default contracts that are in there. But voila, now you have an FML model on um, chain where you can make predictions um, as long as you make sure it's in the right format. And to me, like, what's the fr whole freaking purpose of this? Why do we need to do this on chain? <laughs> I just literally had this conversation with somebody like two days ago when we were walking from dinner. Um, there, <laughs> there's a lot of benefits to having um, these machine learning models on chain. So to me, like, I see uh, more and more everyday decisions um, being influenced by machine learning. Uh, like public policy, budgets for city council, um, really important issues for like healthcare, right? Um, all these things. And a lot of these decisions are made pretty arbitrarily, right? But what if there was accountability for these organizations to actually be able to show like, hey, these are the actual um, decisions we're making. Here's a record of these things on chain. Here's the accountability of how these models work um, to make sure there's you no know, bias in these models, make sure that there's the data quality is there. Now, will most people actually go and look at these things if you could go to your local city council website and see it? No, but it's there, right? So maybe it will take a few like really passionate citizens to be involved and then you know translates to the rest of the world who may, who may not be technical to say like, hey, this is what's happening. And, you know, we have like a good infrastructure, good ethics in place for how we're developing these models. Uh, so yeah. So, whoop. yeah, and I'll just go here really quickly. So, uh, so I'm gonna finish. Yeah, so yeah, again, I'm I, part of DORG. Uh, we're building the decentralized web. We're working on a lot of cool stuff like this and I don't know if we have any time for questions, but yeah, I hope this piqued your curiosity a little bit for federated machine learning and that you deploy your own model. Definitely check out the flowers package. It's very like user friendly. Um, you can literally have your own FML model on chain for like under an hour or so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, that was, that was great. Uh, you kind of lost me uh, at the uh, Onyx to MPC uh, part there. Like you just said, let's convert to bytecode. Can you kind of go through that and you explain exactly what that bytecode is? And yeah, so if you just put in like the um, raw model, like the like how default comes out in Python, like it's not understandable um, for the smart contract. So I tried a lot of different formats. Um, and it wasn't until I tried Onyx, the Onyx format that I was actually able to get the smart contract to compile and actually deploy to chain. But Onyx is like pretty, uh, I would say pretty commonplace. Like it's like basically for interoperability. So you can switch between platforms for your machine learning models and uh, do a lot of things like outside of even blockchain space. Like it's a pretty like 
sturdy formats you can use? Um, okay, so um, tell me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to recap what you said. Okay, so I, I kind of understand what Onyx is, right? So, yeah. so basically you're taking the model in the Onyx format and then compiling it into a uh, smart contract bytecode. And is why you had like that assembly kind of like block and you're just running that in a smart contract. Yeah. Right. So isn't, isn't that like slow? If, if the model is big, it's going to be kind of like awful, right? Yeah. So like uh, with the example, like even for that library, it's like over 66,000 images and images already are pretty like hefty in terms of memory. I was able still to, um, to compile it within like a few minutes. I think that there probably has to be considerations in the future about even larger um, files, right? So there needs to be kind of like this interface of like what will be done off chain and what can be done on chain. Like as you saw, like all of the development of the model itself was off chain, but actually like putting it, the model itself, like the output of that, of the training on, on chain doesn't take up that um, much time to compile. Um, that's why I think all the talks today were interesting about like um, Bacalao and uh, different ways of thinking about compute over a, uh, compute on data. Uh, is I don't know. I mean, what would it be what would it be like if we had video? I think video would be very interesting um, because that would be very memory intensive. Like, I want to test it out. I want to see like these are new areas of combining technologies together. So we just have to keep trying out and experimenting and see what happens. Thank you. Thank you.